So let's pray real quick. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would just open your heart up. Um, I, I am in great expectation, Father, for what you have. And so, Father, we just thank you. We love you and we praise you. In your precious name, Father, we pray. Amen. So, last week, we spoke about the rock of Christ. And how, if we're not established and anchored onto that, then when the winds come, we're blown away. When the winds come, we're just blown away. So yesterday I'm watching the tall ships in Portland and I'm watching these ships come in and, you know, they're pretty majestic. They weren't under complete sail because, well, I guess you can't steer them real well when you're just by sail power. So some came in in sail power and some came in in engine power. But I was thinking about that this morning at 5 o'clock and I was thinking about this fact. If there wasn't a lighthouse, if there wasn't something to warn them of rocks that were going to come into their way, then they would crash upon the rocks. But then I started thinking of this. The anchor that holds them has to be very, very strong and secure. And without Christ in our life, we don't have a secure enough anchor to hold us. We are going to be blown everywhere at every time. So, when God gave me this series of messages a few weeks ago, I thought, okay, Lord, you're going to give me everything you need, so let's dance. And he said this morning, not today. <laughs> I said, all right. He says, trust me. So I have like a, a half a page of notes. I have no idea where I'm going. So let's begin this journey together. So uh, please turn to Hebrews 12 with me. I have to go put my second set of eyes on. And then it doesn't help that allergy season is in like full swing. So the Hebrews 12. And it's verse 26. At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. And I, I'm reading out of the NIV. In the last few years, we have experienced what I would call spiritual tremors. Okay? Now, a spiritual tremor is something that's not really the huge happening. It's not the big thing. It's a number of little things that happen that shake us up a little bit. All right? Just kind of settles us down a tad. And so in the last few years, we have experienced spiritual tremors. All right? Little shakings. Those spiritual tremors are made to prepare us for the big shaking that will be coming. All right? We're going to talk a little bit about Peter today. All right? Peter was one of the disciples that was with Jesus. And I said, Lord, I need, I need some kind of illustration. He said, I want you to go to Luke. We're going to go to Luke in a minute. But he said, I want you to talk a little bit about Peter. Because even though Peter was established, he was shook. And when Peter shook, he ran. So we're going to look a little bit at Peter. Because, because in the days to come, and we've, we've actually experienced, and this is my way of addressing it, we've actually experienced a little bit of shaking in this church. I was told it was going to come. I knew it was going to come. God said, listen, 
I'm going to shake it. I said, yeah, whatever, God, that's cool. I'm, I'm down with that. Because, see, when you learn to walk with God, you learn to know that every now and then he likes to grab the tree and go... <laughs> and you either hang on with both hands or you go... Boop. And so we had some boops happen. But that's, that's godly, and the Word of God speaks about it, that every now and then He will shake it up a little bit. And He will shake off the things that do not produce. Okay, so let's, let's read a little bit more into Hebrews. All right, I think we already went to the last piece there. Yes, we did. So in the last few years, we've seen spiritual tremors that have been happening in our lives. I'm sure, I'm sure most of you have had something in your life in the last couple of years that is shaking you up a little bit. And if you haven't, hold on, because it's coming. I will guarantee you that at some point in time, God's going to take your little toe and go, boom, just like that. And you're going to go, woo. Because that's what God does. But there's reasons for shaking, and I'm going to tell you in a couple minutes why he shakes us. So, the Word of God has been shaken many times to see what would happen. The enemy shakes to destroy, but God's shaking has a different purpose. And it's a purpose to strengthen, a purpose to draw closer, to the foundation. So when God shakes you, He shakes you to draw Him closer to Him. I've learned that in my, in my walk with God, that when the Lord says, hey, hold on for a second, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blast you real quick, then I go, okay, Lord, because you know, and I've learned this through a period of time, and, and this is something, hopefully in this, in this, in this lesson today that you will learn too that if you hold on but if you do fall fall down to the foundation don't allow yourself to be thrown free when you fall fall straight down you see when you are attached to the rock and your foundation is the absolute truth of the word of God there's only one way to go in shaking, and that's to the foundation. You see, when the enemy shakes you, and he will, he'll shake you too. He'll come along and he'll shake you a little bit, but his shaking is to throw you free. You see, the enemy knows whether or not you're securely attached to the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. And so when he shakes you, he knows if he shakes you hard enough, he's going to cast you out into oblivion. Because again, he comes to seek and destroy. But Jesus is strength. And when God shakes us, he wants to strengthen us. So don't think shaking is bad sometimes. Shaking is good. All right? Shaking is good. So let's go on a little bit more here. So let's turn to Luke 22. And we're going to go to Luke 22, verse 25 for starters. Actually, we're probably going to go to Luke 21. The reason some of these people laugh for you visitors is I always start at a verse and I always end up somewhere else when I'm starting because, well, God says, no, nah, we're going we're gonna to kick it up a notch. We're at 21. And so since I'm a servant and my life belongs to Christ, then whatever God says, I need to do. That's... That's how I've learned 
to be in the right place with God. It's to never say no. <clears throat> so, let's read. Verse 21. But Jesus says, but the hand of him who is going to betray me is with me today. So here we are at the Last Supper. Let me set the scene. Here we are at the Last Supper. Everybody's gathered around. It's the 12 that Jesus has said, hey, come on, we need to go up into the upper room. We're going to have a little gathering. I need to talk to you, my friends. I need to talk to you, my friends. While he's there, the first thing he says to them is this. One of you will betray me tonight. Now you would think that after being with this man for a long time and seeing the things that he had done, that the room would have fallen into silence. But the first thing that happened here was they first started pointing fingers and going, it's not me, who is it, is it you, is it you, is it you? Because everybody wants to point a finger. You see there was a little bit of shaking going on. So they're sitting there. And then, from that it goes to, well, I'm the greatest one of all of us, so it can't be me. Well, I'm the greatest one of all of us, so that it cannot be me. Now, if you know anything, I like this speaker here. Now, if you know anything about Peter, Peter was a very vocal person. Peter was very opinionated. And Peter was always the one to speak his mind. And so I can imagine that this might have been Peter saying, well, you know, I am too great to betray you. I am too wonderful to betray you. I know who you are. I would never betray you. I was with you on the mount when we saw Elijah and Moses. I I will follow you to the ends of the earth. Oh, I hate it when people say that. I will follow you forever, wherever you go. I have to say, don't follow me, because I'm liable to run into a wall at some point in time in my life. And really, I don't want you behind me when I do it. I want you to follow God. Because God's the anchor. God's the anger. When we follow God, it's the only way we're going to get through the gate. The straight gate. There is no other way. So we don't follow a man. Now I know Jesus in his mind is going, I cannot believe these guys are arguing about who's the greatest. I just told them that I will no longer be with them. That God is calling me home. So, let's look a little close at Peter's life. Yes, he was an amazing disciple. But Peter, is not walking in the character of God. He had God established, but he was not walking in the character of who he was. There are people that will have God established, but they will not have his character. They will not have his like-mindedness, and they will not have his heart. The word obey comes into mind. The word obey.
obey comes into mind. The, the word pride comes into mind. So Peter had great pride. Peter knew who Jesus was. But Peter did not have the character of God established deep within his heart. Hold on, Peter. You're about to get shaken. So, we can have amazing knowledge of who God is. And we can even walk the walk. But if we are not established in the character of God, when the time comes to be shaken, we will surely not be able to stand. Every day, every day, something in this church gets shaken. Many of you never even know what's happening. But every, and, and thank God you don't, because some of you would probably freak out and go, oh my gosh. But see, I'm used to being shaken. Because every time I'm shaken, it brings me closer to God. Every time you're shaken, it should bring you closer to God and bring you into obedience with the Word. Because like I said, these are just the tremors. These, these aren't even the shaking yet. These are spiritual tremors designed to draw you closer to who Jesus Christ has called you to be. To serve under His Father. So every single day there's a tremor here. And we hold on. And some people don't. And some things don't. And some people just go, I can't handle it. And run away. It happens everywhere. Don't think of it as a bad thing. Think of it as a growing thing. God loves you enough that he's going to shake you up just a little bit. But I think of, I think it's the Vandell song. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. There is nowhere to run and there is nowhere to hide from God. Because, well, he sees everything. If you read Revelations, he has all eyes. And he knows. So here comes Paul. Or Peter, I'm sorry. I keep getting those two P guys mixed up. So. Go marry in there, Bill. When I say established, I mean what have you built your temple on and what materials have you used? See, if I use this, the Word of God, then, then my building materials are amazing. But if I use every self-help book known to man, my materials are wrong. I'm building a house like the three little pigs built out of hay and grass. I'm building it out of wood, hay, and stubble. But, but the brick, the solid foundation and Word is what I need to build my house upon. These are the materials that I need so that when the wind blows, I am not thrown, little pig, little pig, let me in. Little put your name here, little put your name here, let me in. I'm going to hop and puff and blow your house in. In the book of Job, the Bible tells me that he roams always. Seeking to who he can destroy. Jesus says, listen, I will shake you. I will shake you. But it's to draw you closer to me. If we keep going on in Luke. Oh. So a dispute arose among them as to which one was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, the king of the Gentiles. 
lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that in verse 26. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? It is not the one who is at the table, but I among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table, in verse 30, in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And here it comes, verse 31. Remember, Peter's name was Simon. And so Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. In other words, hey Simon, Peter, Satan has asked for permission to give you a little shake. You see, Jesus knew that there was something in Peter that needed to come out. And it was pride and self-righteousness. Because pride and self-righteousness is what keeps us from falling absolutely, deeply, intimately, unbelievably in love with God's will. Peter was full of pride. Peter had astounding pride. When Jesus was in the garden, and he was praying for God to be merciful to him. Take this cup from me, Father, please. And God said, no, son, you must go. And they all fell asleep. Do we fall asleep? Sometimes we do. Sometimes we do. And it's at the moments we should be speaking with God. So all of a sudden the guards come in and here's Peter, big bad Peter, whips out his sword and cuts off a centurion's ear. So Peter was courageous, yes we know. But Peter was not going to allow himself to be taken. And Jesus said, no, no Peter, no. Don't do that. Don't react in your flesh. Don't react in your pride. Don't react in yourselves. Respond in me. Respond in me. So let's go on. So... And Jesus says, and it's pretty, pretty huge when Jesus says, I have prayed for you. <laughs> I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, you see, Jesus already knew what was going to happen. Peter was going to fail miserably. Jesus knew that the minute back further that he had said, Peter, you're going to deny me. Oh, I'm never going to deny you. I'll follow you to the end of the earth. Jesus knew that Peter would cave. Just like Jesus knows we're going to cave sometime. But he also says, there's a way back. So if you fall, there's a way back. You see, he says right here, I, I pray, I pray, son, Peter, that you not fail. And when you have turned back, that I want you to strengthen your brother. 
he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison and to death. Boy, we love to say those words. I'm ready to follow you, Jesus, wherever. Great, I want you to go to Borneo. I want you to live in a tent for a number of years. I want you to wear nothing but a loin skin. I want you to eat bugs and all sorts of crazy creatures. I want you to go out and become a servant to the least of my people. Well, God, you know, that's not what I signed on for. <laughs> yes, it was. Yes, it was. Lord, I'm ready. Wherever you send me, I will go. If it's to the next door neighbor that can't stand people, I will go. If it's to go into Portland and be with the homeless people for a long period of time, I will go. I will go wherever you need me to go. You can only say that when you're attached to the cornerstone of Zion and when you have been shaken all of your life you fall straight down onto the foundation. Because then and only then do you really understand and is the established heartbeat of Jesus Christ within you. Within you. You see, Peter was going to come back after he was shaken. We know that because we already know the story. In John 2.16, the Word of God tells me this. For everything in this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not of the Father, but of the world. The world and its desires all pass away. Pride will destroy us. In Ezekiel 28, 11 through 9, you can write that down. I'm not going to ask you to go there. But it explains why Satan was cast out of heaven. It was pride. It all had to do with pride. Pride keeps us from ever seeing the heartbeat of God. Pride keeps us from understanding the will of God. Pride keeps us from being a servant of God. Pride comes before the fall. Peter was very prideful that night. Oh God, here I come. I'm going to save your son. Look at me. And he cut that poor centurion's ear right off. And all he was doing was his job. He was following the command that was given him. 